Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink and Ariel Gold, who is the national co-director of Code Pink, also a coordinator of our Middle East campaign. Uh, we'll start with some updates, but coming up, we are really excited to feature Abby Martin, the documentarian, citizen journalist who made Gaza Fights for Freedom, directed that. And uh, we will have a lively discussion and show some of her film clips as well and talk about that. Uh, and please stay with us for the Capitol Calling Party, which comes at the end. We'll be calling into Congress to co-sponsor H.R. 2590, Betty McCollum's bill, to condition USA to Israel, as well as send uh, a message to the White House or the State Department. All right, Medea, you have an update for us? Uh, well, I'm going to update a little on Latin America. We have a winner announced in the Peruvian election uh, last night, the uh, official announcement that Pedro Castillo uh, had won. Of course, he won a long time ago, except that he was being challenged uh, a la Trump. And those challenges have left the right wing in Peru quite divided. It actually turned out to be a good thing in the long run. And this very progressive, humble uh, high school teacher from the rural areas will become Peru's new president as of July 28th. And we're very excited about all the positive changes that can bring for Peru uh, and for Latin America. And then there is the issue of Cuba. Since the protests there, the uh, right wing, uh, especially in the Cuban American community has gone crazy and said, this is our moment after 60 years to topple the Cuban government. Of course, they've been saying that all the time. Uh, and they have been pushing the um, uh, Republicans and Democrats in Congress to get even tougher on Cuba, which is so sad because the reason people are out in the streets is because of lack of food and medicine. A lot of that attributed to the blockade and if Biden really cared about Cubans, he would lift the blockade, which is what we are calling for him to do. And we are going to welcome the uh, Cuban Americans who want to lift the blockade and have been walking from Miami all the way to Washington, D.C., 1,300 miles in the scorching sun of, of summertime. They will arrive on Saturday and Sunday. There is a uh, welcoming for them in Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C. So any of you near here or know anybody near here, please get them out because the right wing is mobilizing a counter demonstration at the same time, same place. And then a couple of other updates around uh, Cuba is that many of you have helped us uh, to raise funds for buying syringes. And today we just held a press conference announcing that the first shipment of syringes, two containers full, totaling 1.6 million syringes, arrived in the port of uh, Mariel in Cuba. And there are another 4.4 million that are on their way for a total of 6 million. We've raised over half a million dollars. And now we're going to keep raising funds for medical supplies. So you can go to the Code Pink website and donate to that and that would be wonderful. And one more announcement is that look out for the New York Times full page ad that we will have on uh, Friday, which is calling on Biden to lift the embargo with many notable people around the United States who've signed on to that. So that's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Medea. That is really inspiring, uh, all the money that was raised to send the syringes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on the War Powers Resolution that was introduced today. This is a new War Powers Resolution authored by Bernie Sanders of Vermont, Mike Lee, a Republican from Utah, and Chris Murphy, a Democrat from Connecticut. Uh, this is a bipartisan joint resolution to basically remove U.S. armed forces from hostilities between the Saudi-led coalition and the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, the bill will force the first ever vote in the Senate to withdraw U.S. armed forces from an unauthorized war. As a result of the Saudi-led war, which the U.S. has funded, a child under the age of five in Yemen dies of preventable causes every 10 minutes. And now I want to share David Swanson's analysis. He's our friend who heads World Beyond War. He sent out an email analyzing the new War Powers Resolution, and 
Here's what he had to say. He said, it repeals the War Powers Resolution of 1973 and replaces it with a revised version that is better than the original. It repeals the AUMFs, the 2002 for Iraq, the 2001 AUMF that basically uh, green lights all of our wars and drone attacks. It's very positive. It strengthens the means by which Congress could not just end a war, but also block a weapon sale and put an end to a declared state of emergency. The new legislation is longer. It's more detailed than the, than the previous one, the previous War Powers Resolution. Uh, and this may make the biggest difference when it comes to the definition of what are hostilities. This new bill defines hostilities to include distant war by missiles and drones. So it's not just US troops, which it had been previously. The new bill also introduces the need for a president to request an authorization from Congress when he or she has launched a war, but it doesn't make mention of what happens if the president doesn't ask for Congress's permission, as we've seen in the past, right? Uh, the legislation introduced in the past by Congressman, Congresswoman Gabbard, Tulsi Gabbard, made presidential wars automatic impeachable offenses if they did not have the approval of Congress. So we look forward to seeing what happens with this resolution, but we, we are very glad to see that it has been introduced. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our other co-host tonight, our national co-director, Ariel Gold. And Ariel, when you're done, you can pass it back to me. Great, well, I wanna begin by saying how excited I am by this new War Powers Act. Um, I think many of us uh, witnessed during the recent brutal assault on Gaza that uh, in the midst of that, the US approved a $735 million munition sale to Israel. And they did so by informing Congress when it was pretty much too late for Congress to um, uh, gather up a resolution of disapproval to block this. But this new War Powers Act, one of the things that it does is it changes who the onus is on. So instead of uh, the executive branch approving an arms sale and then Congress having a very, very uh, limited time with which to introduce legislation to block it, instead the executive branch, the president would have to seek congressional approval from Congress in order to uh, put through any weapons deal over, I, I believe it's $14 million. So I'm really excited about this. If this had already been in place, we would not have this $735 million munitions sale to Israel after they have just used up their munitions, massacring Palestinians. Okay, so that said, there's a lot going on. Um, in Palestine and Israel right now. Uh, last week, uh, Israel blocked feminist activist and a uh, member of parliament, Khalida Gerard, from leaving prison to attend the funeral of her beloved daughter. Uh, Khalida Gerard spent over a year in administrative detention. Administrative detention is a part of Israel's military law where they arrest Palestinians and hold them without charge or trial. So she spent over a year in administrative detention, no charge, no trial, the evidence is secret, before she uh, finally took a two-year deal with Israel, which uh, will be completing in the fall and in the meantime, her, her beloved uh, daughter passed away and she wanted to attend the funeral. And as a, basically as a show of cruelty, uh, Israel did not allow that. Now, just this week, as in just yesterday, uh, there's a lot of news coming out of, um, out of the area. And the first is, is quite horrific. It has been revealed that the Israeli cyber firm NSO has been selling its software. The software is called Pegasus to a number of authoritarian states, including Saudi Arabia, that the states have then used to spy specifically on journalists. We assume activists and others as well, activists and dissidents, um, but specifically 180 cases of spying on journalists. Now this is through their cell phones 
This is called a no-touch uh, spyware technology, basically. Uh, it infects your phone, but you didn't click anything, you didn't do anything. And from there, it can uh, gather any information from your phone. It can also video and audio uh, record you. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that the countries that purchased this Pegasus software, uh, Saudi Arabia, Hunger, Hungary, uh, the UAE, Rwanda, Morocco, India, are all countries that uh, the former prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, had just improved diplomatic relations with. So clearly this was used as a tool uh, to normalize uh, relations with Israel to, to whitewash Israel's crimes against Palestinians. Now, in an incredible piece of uplifting news, and I imagine everybody saw this yesterday, the ice cream company Ben & Jerry's announced that it uh, will no longer be selling its ice cream in illegal Israeli settlements. They have a contract uh, with an Israeli franchisee and that contract expires uh, in December 2022 and they have announced that they will not be renewing that contract. There's a little bit of back and forth here uh, the, the statement that was released by Ben and Jerry's says that they will continue to do business, that they will find somebody new to do business with for doing business inside uh, what's called the Green Line, the, the legal borders of Israel. However, uh, Ben and Jerry's independent board, who is in charge of its social responsibility and has to approve such uh, new contracts uh, said officially that they did not authorize that to be part of the statement. And so basically they've hinted that this is um, an embrace of the full boycott of Israel, that it's likely that Ben and Jerry's will have um, no contracts inside any part of Israel from the Palestine, from the river to the sea, um, in accordance with the BDS movement. So I know that that gave me a lot of hope today and it really showed that the tides are turning, which we've seen in public opinion as well, including, including a new poll that uh, showed that the majority of American Jews support conditioning uh, military aid to Israel so that it does not go to the settlements. So um, with that exciting news, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Marcy. Thank you, Ariel, for all those updates. Yeah, that's great news about Ben & Jerry's. I feel like, well, I can eat it again. <laughs> I never knew ice cream was so political, but it is, it is. And I think this is a huge public uh, relations win for the Palestinians. You cannot underestimate it. So uh, I, at this point, would like to introduce our next guest, our, our featured guest tonight, Abby Martin, the documentarian. I'm gonna introduce her, but then we're gonna go to one of her cliffs. Uh, a little tease, and then bring Abby on. All right, so Abby Martin is a US journalist, a documentarian, a TV reporter, an activist. She is the founder of Media Roots for Citizen Journalism. She serves on the board of Media Freedom Foundation and manages Project Censored. Abby hosted Breaking the Set on RT, Russia's T RT uh, Network in America. Uh, then she launched Empire Files which was an, uh, an internet series that played on Telesur. In 2018, she released Gaza Fights for Freedom, a documentary that we will see parts of tonight uh, that will be spliced in between her presentation and our Q&A with her. So let's see that clip, Mary, please. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. 
Hamas is calling for more bloodshed today on the Israel-Gaza border. Thousands of Palestinians ex expected to riot. To call this a protest is inaccurate. Uh, what actually happened is that Hamas engineered an event where they wanted thousands of people to swarm into Israel. Palestinians reportedly organized by the terror group Hamas are being encouraged to rush security barriers, putting them right in the range of live fire. They were warned to stay away from the border fence. They decided to show up with explosives. They're paying them to get shot, believe it or not. They're paying them something like $500 per gunshot wound. You know, Hamas sent a seven-year-old girl who was wearing a Minnie Mouse uh, sweatsuit right up to the fence so that IDF troops would, in their perverse in, in, in the perverse mindset of Hamas would shoot her and kill her. It is reported that someone in a wheelchair was fatally shot, Mr. Ambassador. Hamas is always very good at trying to put out all sorts of propaganda and myths. That's, they're experts at that. And they intentionally right. moved up the day so that it would coincide with the opening of embassy move so that we would all be disgusted and heartbroken when we saw this horrible split screen of Ivanka Trump looking like she was at a country club next right. to poor, desperate people dying I, in I Gaza. I agree with you. They planned that. Absolutely. Right. And I'm just saying, let's not fall for a trap that is being set by a, a theocratic I, authoritarian I'm, group that is sending no, I'm not women and children I don't think I'm falling for a trap. No. I, I, agree. I couldn't agree more with all of that. I think it's terrible that Hamas is butchering its own children. Hamas is conducting massive self-genocide. They want to pile up as many uh, civilian dead as they can because somebody said they use, I mean, it's gruesome, they use telegenically dead Palestinians for their cause. They want the more dead, the better. They're pushing civilians, women, children into the line of fire with the view of getting casualties. We try to minimize the casualties. They're trying to incur casualties in order to... Uh, uh, in order to put pressure on Israel, which is horrible. What they're deliberately doing is seeking to kill as many Palestinians as possible in order to uh, yell to the world to help us. And much of the world is condemning us uh, for war crimes. Basically, they're serving Hamas's goal. That's just what Hamas is about. Make no mistake, Hamas is pleased with the results from yesterday. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel has. And that said, Israel only targeted people who were actively engaged in violence. We only use live fire in a measured and surgical way. Why the Israeli forces were shooting dead protesters at the Gaza crossings. Well, we can't put all these people in jail. Chilling words. Gaza Fights for Freedom, you saw a clip from it. And now I would like to introduce the documentarian who directed this, Abby Martin. Welcome to Code Pink Congress. Thank you so much. It's an incredible honor to be a part of this great panel discussion so far. Thank you, Ariel, for all those incredibly positive updates. And I guess I should have warned you guys uh, about a trigger warning <laughs> before watching that. It is pretty harrowing to see you know, what we wanted to do, the intent behind putting that montage together is to really just show what the Israeli spokespeople will say about uh, Palestinians and, and this justification for the bloodletting that we saw during the Great March of Return, which of course was a mass peaceful action. There was absolutely had nothing to do with Hamas. Um, it, it was all just people on their own accord going to this partition with bared chests, raising flags, and they were met with the same sort of brutality and violence that Palestinians are met with every time they resist, uh, whether it's peacefully or with armed resistance. And so, you know, this really, really disturbing and kind of sadistic montage of Israeli spokespeople essentially speaking to Americans, right? I mean, this is why they have um, people out there that that sound like you and me. I mean, this is this is supposed to be propaganda for the American audience to dehumanize and otherize Palestinians to make it okay that this ongoing massacre continued for a year. But um, what was really incredible about the montage is that it's juxtaposed with the most incredible footage of Palestinians just speaking for themselves. I mean, that's what this film was, was really, you know, I directed it through, of course, the blockade. I'm banned for life. I, I can't get into Gaza. Um, but it, it was an incredible thing to work with seven Palestinian photojournalists on the ground, producers who were able to film the interviews the way they wanted to um, get the footage and, and show it in the way that they wanted to depict themselves and really uplift those voices that are completely obfuscated 
from the U.S. owned corporate media. I mean, from the corporate owned U.S. media rather. And and so that montage is really the only time that you'll hear from Israeli spokespeople um, about what was going on from their perspective. Um, so you know, it's it's that's why we put it together um, because you know the film is obviously very uh, one sided. It's just showing what the Palestinians thought about the march and what they wanted to show about the march and this incredible mass movement. Um, but we did want to show, you know, this is what the propaganda is. And this is what the, these are the words spoken uh, about Palestinians and, and in this grotesque way about this mass march to completely justify these atrocities. And it's just absolutely beyond the pale. Abby, do you want to show the next clip? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we might as well. So this next clip, what you're going to see is actually the statistics, you know, after the march was said and done, um, this was what came out of it. This is this is how many people were shot and killed. And, and we wanted to put this together um, um, for for the audience. So let's check it out. The evidence of numerous blatant war crimes and these regular massacres are there for all to see. But let's just take a look at what the United Nations found in their investigation, facts that cannot be refuted. The UN report released February 28, 2019, documented the extensive human rights violations during the Great March of Return through 2018. Of the 183 fatalities caused by sniper fire investigated by the UN Commission, 171 were clearly murdered, shot in the head or torso. Nearly 8,000 people were wounded by live ammunition. Over that eight-month period, 21 were left permanently paralyzed, and 122 more required limb amputations, including 20 children. In stark contrast, the UN report found zero fatalities on the Israeli side. Not one Israeli soldier was killed or seriously wounded. Four claimed scratches from thrown rocks and could only cite property damage from kites and balloons as reason to continue the ongoing massacre. Flaming kites and balloons over the border. Throwing oh, no. rocks comes with a death sentence. You can see that Hashem Fayez Abu Okel is posing no threat to Israeli lives. He's not armed and he's not breaking through the border fence. But when the shot rings out, it is he who is shot in the head. If you want to fast forward like 20 seconds, it's, it's a tough clip right there, yeah. Snipers started using live ammunition at 9 a.m. Over the course of the day, the IDF shot and killed 18 unarmed marchers and wounded 765 others with live ammunition. Among the casualties the first day, 19-year-old Bader Sabag was resting, smoking a cigarette 300 meters away when he was shot in the head and killed. 24-year-old mechanic Naji Abu Johair was standing wrapped in a Palestinian flag 300 meters away from the fence when he was shot in the abdomen. The youngest casualty was a two-year-old child. The oldest, a 71-year-old woman. Six weeks later, on May 14th, in one of the most egregious massacres of unarmed peoples in modern history, Israeli snipers killed 60 people on this day alone including seven children. The death toll could have been far higher, considering the fact they shot and wounded 1,162 additional people with live ammunition. Just a sampling of these fatalities demonstrate their barbarity. 21-year-old university student Ali Kafaja was on his cell phone about 150 meters away when he was shot in the head. 20-year-old Mahmoud Jundia was filming the protest 50 meters away from the fence when he was shot. As he lay on the ground dying, Israeli snipers finished him off with a shot to the back. One international war correspondent interviewed for the UN report recounted the scene. Every few minutes, you would hear a shot ring out, and you would see someone fall, and then another. It went on for hours. There was a constant stream of bloody bodies being carried back towards the ambulances. It was surreal and endless. 
And she goes on to say, you know, I've been in the middle of war zones in Yemen and Iraq, and I've never seen anything like this, this slow, methodical shooting where Israeli snipers were perched behind sand dunes like cowards and literally taking out marching Palestinians like target practice. Um, you know, and I, it just flies in the face of all humanity. Um, and we wanted to show through the base, through the lens of this UN report, because a lot of Americans do um, hold up the UN as a sacred institution. And, you know, it, and, and it does, you know, it's seen as this kind of body that administers international law and such. And even this report by the UN found these egregious war crimes were committed, these direct targeting and killings of journalists, um, elderly people, disabled people, children, children, um, and also medics. I mean, it's just unbelievably astounding when you actually look at the documentation from the UN report about these grave crimes um, that are that were committed in our names and continue to be committed in our names. And that's why we actually chose this framing of international law with this UN report and the Geneva Conventions, of course, talking about how, you know, even during an armed battle, like let's say Hamas was armed and was fighting the Israeli military, it would still be considered uh, illegal and it would still be considered a war crime to actually target these categories of people under the Geneva Conventions. And so that's why it's just so much more horrifying when you see that this was just a peaceful action and that these people were killed administering medical aid. Of course, the story of Razan al-Najjar. Now, those statistics, um, of course, you know, it, it's, it's hard to actually kind of zero in on, on so many people and talk about their stories and dreams and aspirations. Of course, every single person who was killed has those. Um, and that's why, you know, we start with the st statistics, of course, and then we go into the story of Razan al-Najjar, the, the heroic medic uh, feminist who was the first female on the front lines of the march and how she was actually directly targeted and killed by Israeli snipers as well and, and talk to her friends and family and colleagues about who she was and what her true legacy was. Because uh, as you'll see in this next clip, um, Israeli authorities actually not only justified her death by saying, you know, excusing away that she was, oh no, she was just killed by shrapnel. Oh no, um, she was actually a human shield, you know, releasing a propaganda video, actually calling her a human shield and, and mincing her words, um, which you'll see in this next clip. But we wanted to give space to her family and friends to talk about who she really was, because after she was killed, the New York Times, who had previously uh, profiled her, um, in part, that's why I think that she was targeted because she was getting all this press and changing society from within, you know, and um, and the New York Times actually did a follow up investigation where they gave an Israeli general just carte blanche, like a, 10 minutes to just excuse away her death and maybe just 20 second sound bites from her mother and colleagues. And so we wanted to, you know, give due diligence and actually do justice for Razan. And that, that's why we chose to highlight her mother just such an incredible advocate for justice um, and who's fighting for justice for her daughter. And so let's hear from Sabrine. أنا بدي حق رزان بدي أنا تتعاقب الحكومة الإسرائيلية بشكل كامل على اللي عملته في بنتي على الجرائم اللي بتعمله في الشعب الفلسطيني أنا بدي أقف قدام القانون العالمي كله في المحاكم في المحاكم الدولية كلها أقف أنا مستعدة أقف أنا قدامه ويواجهوني وواجههم وأنا بطالب بطالب من كل العالم من كل أم بتشوفني قلبها موجوع على بنتها مثل أنا قلبي موجوع على بنتي ما حد بحس بالنار إلا اللي شايلها أنا قلبي يوميا بتقطع على بنتي ناس بتفتكرين لا أنا زعلانة على بنتي هاي أول فرحة بنتي إيش الزنب اللي عملته أنا في الوقت اللي كنت بستناها أجوزها وأفرح بيها وأشيل أولادها حرموني إيش عملت رزان رزان ما بتستاهل إنهم يقتلوها بدم بارد والعالم كله بيتفرج لا والله ورزان مش راح تمر قضيتها مر الكرام After international outcry over Razan's death, the Israeli military responded by releasing this video. I'm 
سعيد فرزان النجار أن هنا على خطوط التماس أشكل درع بشري In the actual video that's not maliciously doctored, Razan clearly explains how she shields the wounded and dying to save their lives, as any combat medic would say. It's a really powerful, uh, you know, statement from her mother. And she goes on to just say, we don't need sympathy. We need our rights. You know, how long will the world sit back and watch these crimes be committed against the Palestinians? We've suffered. We've endured for decades. How many more children need to die? How many more people need to suffer? How long will this go on? You know, and this is just Gaza. I mean, of course, as Ariel uh, elucidated, the West Bank is is under this brutal military dictatorship um, that Palestinians are suffering through on a daily basis, being imprisoned without trial or charges for years on end. In this administrative detention, you can't hold up a Palestinian flag without being brutalized and subject to arrest potentially. It is an absolute atrocity. And uh, the most inspiring thing about it, though, as Razan's father said, you know, Israel is known to be a state above the law. Um, and of course, they go on to advocate BDS. And as as allies in America, I think that that's that's our duty um, to take that call and run with it, um, which is exactly what people have been doing so diligently. Ben and Jerry's now coming out on the front lines and declaring that they are not going to support um, or sell their products in occupied territories and even beyond that, which is an incredible incredible thing that's happened. Um, you know, my whole thing is that this is an optimistic time um, because every time there's some horrific onslaught of violence in Gaza or something like a flashpoint like Sheikh Jarrah or Silwan, the world becomes attentive. All of a sudden people are ready to hear what they may have been lied about their entire lives. And of course, what the media hides, this, this reality that's so stark and so obvious once you really do open your eyes to the other side. Um, and this is a breaking point. This is, this is something that I truly believe is the beginning of the end for the apartheid state. Um, because once you have Human Rights Watch, once you have Bet Salam, which is an organization that exists within Israeli society, once you have sitting Congress people declaring Israel is an apartheid state, the narrative now becomes, well, what can we do about apartheid? What can we do to administer equal rights for all? What can we do to condition aid to make sure Israel adheres to international law, ends the occupation, uh, ends the illegal settlements? I mean, this is now going to be the conversation moving forward. It's not, you know, you're anti-Semitic if you criticize a government that's committing war crimes. No, now you're on the defense to explain why you support apartheid. You know, the narrative has completely flipped on its head. Not only are we seeing these dramatic pole shifts in public consciousness with Democrats and young Jewish Americans, um, but, you know, looking at Gallup polls, like, for example, who interview American voters every year on the Israel-Palestine issue for the first time this year, those voters said that Israel needs to be pressured as opposed to Palestine. This is due uh, to the advent of social media. I mean, Palestinians are able to film their own reality for the first time. They have forced the narrative shift. These historic protests, the uprisings that we saw, not only across Palestine, across party lines, but across the United States for the first time in this, the history of this country. I mean, these were the biggest pro-Palestine solidarity demonstrations that we have ever seen. And I think the swell and upsurge of Black Lives Matter and the consciousness shifting of police brutality really opens that international solidarity um, where people can say, look, Palestinians are actually suffering the same struggle, the same fight, uh, linking these struggles together, whether it be Black Lives Matter, whether it be immigrant detention and using Israeli military technology, all of these things, I think, are contributing to this mass awakening. Um, and the latest violent brutality that we saw issued on Gaza, where 70 children were killed. Israel has completely lost its moral high ground. They cannot walk away from this with their normal PR. Um, so they try to deflect it and basically blame 
a rise in anti-Semitism to pro-Palestine solidarity activism. And that was a very, very disingenuous campaign that we saw running for three weeks after um, this, this latest massacre. But I think that it's also just that they cannot dictate the agenda anymore. And so they're desperate, right? They're desperate to conflate these issues when really, if you're looking at is, if there's a rise of anti-Semitism, it's obviously due to a rise of right-wing extremism. This is coupled with all of these other, you know, horrific mentalities and ideologies that are on the rise worldwide. But it certainly has nothing to do with pro-Palestine solidarity activism. But unfortunately, that's what you saw the corporate media running with because they cannot defend Israel's actions anymore. They cannot defend Israel leveling giant apartment buildings using targeted munitions to target sleeping families in their homes. This collective punishment and torture on the residents of Gaza. Um, and so the international community has woken up. They are looking in, in sheer horror at what's happening. And we all know that politics follows the cultural shift, right? And the consciousness has completely shifted in this country. And you see whether it's the Meteor Festival a couple of years ago during the Great March of Return, where all of these artists were dropping like flies. They refused to play in Tel Aviv. They refused to play in Jerusalem because they were shamed from their audiences. Lana Del Rey, uh, Demi Lovato, all of these people, right? This is a huge, dramatic thing that they no longer have people like Natalie Portman, Seth Rogen to go out and walk uh, you know, basically run defense for Israel's war crimes anymore. Even Seth Rogen just went on the Mark Moran podcast and he said there's something deeply wrong with what we've been told about Israel and, and their, you know, this, this notion of eternal right to self-defense. I mean, they, he was one of their biggest advocates just a couple of years ago. So all of these things coupled together, Natalie Portman giving back this million dollar reward, um, you know, saying that she doesn't feel comfortable representing Israel anymore. It may seem small, but it's absolutely not. Because once you have no one that you can parade out there to defend these crimes, then you're just stuck with the politicians, right? And we all know where this is going. And we know that these anti-BDS laws that have been passed in 30 states in the US are done to preemptively hold back that tide of justice. That is why they've been doing it. I they mean, know what's coming. Yeah, they know what's coming brought that up, the BDS legislation, because somebody posted in the chat uh, to congratulations on winning your suit in Georgia. And before you uh, share that, I just want to say that the American Israel Public Affairs Committee uh, has been working over time to try to push through these anti-BDS laws and uh, basically uh, apply duct tape to activists' mouth, uh, calling them uh, anti-Semitic if they criticize Israel. And in California, where I am, there was a year-long pushback on an effort to institute one of these anti-BDS laws that would have created actually an enemies list uh, and would have put people on the enemies list if they uh, were head of a corporation or a nonprofit and uh, had come out in support of BDS. And then they would be prohibited from receiving state contracts. Uh, we were able to water down this and Esty Chandler, who's with us tonight, she's chair of Jewish Voice for Peace in Los Angeles, was part of this struggle. And we were able to basically water down that bill until it was nothing. It's, it just says that uh, it's basically duplicative of existing law that people shouldn't be discriminating against others. Uh, so that was, you know, it, we saw that entry in California. Tell us about your victory in Georgia. Yeah, just really briefly. Um, I The law in Georgia, the anti-BDS law there is now unenforceable due to my litigation. I worked with CARE and the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, and we launched a lawsuit against the state of Georgia because they gave me such a contract. These contracts exist, as you mentioned, um, in states all across the country. I think they're in 30 states now, where if you are doing independent contracting work for a state institution, you are given a contract that says you cannot engage in a boycott against Israel. It's an open uh, admission of foreign interference. The fact that not only organizations like what you're talking about, Marcy, but also the Israeli government has bragged about this. You saw Netanyahu take to Twitter and say, we have worked very hard to advocate passing these bills across the US. I mean, it just flies in the face of any sort of comprehension um, that you know we constantly hear ad nauseum about Russia, about Putin interfering in our democracy. This is the direct admission from a foreign government of undermining our civil liberties and first amendment. And it's just amazing that not, that not more news covers this. I mean, this is the black hand of the state coming down and actually censoring and policing pro-Palestine speech, 
We hear constantly about cancel culture. We hear constantly about censorship when it comes to big tech, rightfully so. But this is a huge issue. And I do think that pro-Palestine speech is the most criminalized and policed speech across the U.S. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that? Why are they working so hard to stimmy and stifle this kind of speech? Because they know what's coming. They know the tide of justice is nearing. And they know that BDS will inevitably bring down apartheid just like it did Jim Crow apartheid here and South African apartheid. And that is why it is so crucial for allies uh, in the United States to take heed of this call and act in concert with Palestinians urging for the boycott, divestment, sanctions efforts. And we see it working, whether it's the Zim boat shipments being blocked um, in different ports, whether it's Ben and Jerry's, I mean, I mean that, and also the cultural boycott, like I said before, I mean, Hollywood celebrities, um, musicians, that is a huge monumental thing because what it really is about is about isolation. We're not trying to cripple the, the Israeli economy. We're not trying to sanction food and medicine like the U S does to Iranian and Venezuelan citizens. No, of course not. This is about the isolation, just like it was in apartheid South Africa. We need to put these people on the defense and, and basically have them explain away. Why do you support apartheid? And if you do, you're not welcome in these spaces. Yes. Uh, Medea Ariel, feel free to jump in with the question. If you have one, um, I, I wanted to know, somebody asked in the chat, is your film Gaza fights for freedom, Abby, is it playing in Europe? Does it play in Israel? <laughs> How wide is its view? Uh, so it, it has played a couple screens in Israel from uh, my comrades who are anti-Zionists there, and it got an interesting response. Um, it definitely has played all over the world right now. It has Arabic and Spanish subtitles as well as Polish, French. You can check it out on GazaFightsForFreedom.com. It's up for free on YouTube, but you have to go through several layer, layers of like um, screening verifications and stuff. It's very weird. YouTube is definitely throttling the film, has made it very hard to watch, but it is available there if you go through the proper uh, protocols to watch it. Have you been in contact with YouTube about any of that? Yeah, when, it, when we first released it, we, we released it for free um, during the Sheikh Jarrah struggle because, you know, it was so important to get the information out there and uh, YouTube immediately removed it from search results. And so you literally could not find it for like the first week that it was up, which really, I mean, really, really undermined the effort to get it as viral as it could during that flashpoint of struggle uh, a couple months ago but um youtube responded very late and they were just like oh it looks like it's searchable for us now and so something changed but the share um button is no longer there like i said you have to actually prove your identity put in like a credit card number a passport number i mean it's it's crazy it's something that i've actually never seen before on any youtube video <laughs> so they did not respond about that but uh but they did respond about the search results it's just very strange you might have to add them to our Capitol Thawing Party today. <laughs> yeah. so I, I had a question for Ariel to go back to the Ben and Jerry's victory because, you know, on the one hand, it seems like so minor. It's a ice cream company. There's other ice cream companies. Uh, yet you see that the prime minister of Israel is talking about it, that it's created this backlash and uh, the conservative Jewish community in the U.S. calling for boycott of Israel, uh, of Ben and Jerry's. Um, why does this, and, and the fact that Ben and Jerry are both Jewish is, you know, an interesting tidbit in all of this, but why do you think it's created such an uproar? So first of all, you're, you're absolutely right, Medea. So the former prime minister, Netanyahu, called for a boycott. The current prime minister, uh, Naftali Bennett, has promised retribution, and the foreign minister, uh, ridiculously called it anti-Semitic and has actually gone further um, along with the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. And they are calling on the U.S. states, the 30 states that have passed anti-BDS laws to penalize Ben and Jerry's. And uh, there is some analysis on what they can and can't do, like uh, you know, possibly some of the governors of these states were looking at, you know, Greg Abbott and, and the like, uh, can say that uh, if there's a child's birthday party um, that's uh, sponsored by the state, that they can forbid Ben and Jerry's from being there um, and, and similar things. But absolutely, we saw 
uh, Israeli politicians and the Israeli government having an all out temper tantrum. And I want to speak a little bit to the, to the dangerousness of this because anti-Semitism is on the rise right now as are other forms of hatred and as a form of bigotry, it rises with Islamophobia and anti-Black racism and so on. And so when you have these incredibly false claims of anti-Semitism, you, you muddy the waters on uh, what this type of bigotry is, but that's exactly uh, what the Israeli government is doing there, you know, kind of um, in, this, in this act of desperation um, over this issue. And uh, when, when the same thing happened with Airbnb, we campaigned for um, a number of years in that case to have Airbnb stop listing uh, vacation rentals in the settlements. And finally, Airbnb came back and said, okay, we'll stop listing vacation uh, rentals in the, in the settlements, you know, we'll abide by international law. Well, Israel did this same hubbub and, you know, panic and threatened enormous lawsuits. And in that case, Airbnb capitulated and they went back to listing uh, vacation rentals in the, in the settlements. But I don't think we're going to see that in any way, shape or form this time, because as Abby was saying, things have shifted. The tide has turned. Our hard work, our hard advocacy is paying off. And Airbnb, uh, Ben and Jerry's statement was much clearer than even Airbnb's was. It was very clear that this does not align with our values. And I think in this case, we're going to see uh, what's really the first uh, successful large scale boycott of Israel by, by a company and one that it's the company is too big to be taken down with their uh, frivolous lawsuits and these ridiculous false claims of anti-Semitism. Thank you, Ariel. Yeah, uh, I didn't know that about uh, Airbnb that they reversed themselves. All right, uh, question, Medea. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh, do uh, either of you have uh, other examples of um, strategies that have been successful and why is it so difficult if the tide has turned uh, to get Congress people to support just the simple conditioning aid to Israel. If it was up to us, I think we would uh, say zero of our money. Give us our money back that we've given you. <laughs> but um, you know, to even get uh, a significant number of members of Congress to say, yes, let's condition some aid on you know, uh, some human rights issues. Why is it so hard? Well, I think that the Bernie Sanders campaign really uh, paved a new foundation in terms of how um, so-called progressive politicians should be talking about this, right? I mean, he went out there as a, a strong Jewish ally and just said, look, all aid needs to be conditioned um, under international law. And if you actually look at what international law says, it says that you the occupation is illegal, that the settlements are illegal, and that apartheid is illegal, right? So, so it was a pretty radical statement that he was going out there and saying. And I think that that really did open a lot of space for people in the squad and things like that to, to then embrace the language, not tone it down like Bernie actually capitulated later on and said, okay, we need to tone down the language. No, ramp it up, ramp it up. Um, you saw them unapologetically declaring Israel an apartheid state. <clears throat> Look, I, I have the same question, Medea. What the hell is going on in Congress? How is it so difficult to say something so clear? Um, again, how, how much more blood needs to be spilled for you to take the right side in this? to stand on the right side of history. It's not that hard, right? Especially now, it may have been controversial 15 years ago, um, but you know the strength and solidarity of the pro-Palestine movement, and again, opening this awareness and linking it with all of these struggles and putting it at the forefront of anti-imperialism has really shifted things so much. I'm sitting back and waiting, why are there not more people speaking out? Then again, I mean, a lot of the squad members have signed on to Betty McCollin's bill 
And really, you know, Betty McCollum keeps putting this bill out there year after year, and there haven't been that many uh, co-signatories, but now there is. So that is a huge step. There is something to rally behind and advocate for in terms of your local representatives. But I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that the stigma is still still holds strong, especially in the elite liberal establishment, especially when you're looking at politicians. It's a lot of access. It's a lot of uh, power. You know, a lot of these people don't really care about advocating social justice. If they did, they would try to be advocating lifting the sanctions on all of these countries. I mean, there's so many issues that are intertwined that I just sit back in, in complete shock that people who consider themselves progressives and tout themselves as liberals can just completely wave away uh, the atrocities that are committed by U.S. imperialism. And that includes the subsidization of apartheid. Well, there's a lot of fear, obviously, on the part of politicians, lawmakers who don't want to be targeted. Uh, for example, right now, Honey Ajajat Barnes, who often co-hosts the show with us, she's on the ground in Ohio campaigning for Nina Turner. Uh, oh, right. who, yeah, exactly. The campaign of, of ousting them from the opponents, you know, I mean, to all the attack ads, all the lobbying and attack ads to try to get you out of the seat. The Democratic majority for Israel has <laughs> almost a million dollars into defeating Nina and, uh, and supporting another uh, African-American woman. Uh, so, you know, it's testimony to how important it is to have people powered campaigns, people funded campaigns. In Los Angeles, uh, my own union, my teachers union, United Teachers of Los Angeles, which represents 33,000 teachers, uh, is slated to vote on a resolution in support of BDS in September after uh, some of the regional areas voted to support this resolution. And we see you know, the same forces, the Israel lobby coming in very strong, organizing against these teachers, attacking them personally, and so it's a hard fight. They don't call it struggle for nothing, right? And Ariel, I, I, think the, I think the Nina Turner campaign is incredibly important. Um, if we really see Nina Turner uh, take a strong win in this case, we've watched Democratic Majority for Israel run an incredible, as you said, funneling up to a million dollars and an incredible smear campaign. They sent out... Uh, mailers uh, basically saying false information about her that Nina Turner is against minimum wage and against worker rights. And I think if we see her really um, take this win, as we saw Jamal Bowman do against Elliot Engel, then, then we really have this solidification and um, you know this next wave of comfort where U.S. Congress members where politicians begin to recognize that they can say things and that the, the Israel lobby, whether it's APAC or Democratic Majority for Israel, doesn't have the power. They still have the money, but that they no longer have the power that they once had. Yes. And uh, before we go, Abby, I wanted to ask you a question just about the logistics of setting up this film. Uh, how did you do it? Uh, who did you contact? Uh, did you have trouble getting into Gaza? You know, just the basics. Yeah. So uh, Mike, my partner for Empire Files, we were in the West Bank in 2017 and we, we've we done a whole series on our YouTube channel and the Empire Files about reporting from Palestine, everything from home demolitions to settler terrorism, um, very harrowing stuff. And of course, wanted to get into Gaza. So we had all the proper credentials and filled out all the paperwork. And I was told by the press ministry that I was a propagandist and that I was an Iranian spy and that I was banned for life from entering the territory. Uh, I was really appalled. I mean, I'm, I'm used to being called a Russian agent or a Venezuelan agent. So I didn't know where the Iranian spy allegation came from, but needless to say, I know that I, you know, I can't get in there and I, and I couldn't get in to do what I wanted to do in terms of documenting the great March of return because of just how egregious and one-sided the corporate media was covering it. Um, and the passive voice completely obfuscating the issue, um, not explaining the People were literally being sniped uh, by Israeli snipers, you know, children and, and such, as you saw in that horrific media montage. So I worked with my um, my colleague, Kareem, who runs the Council on International Relations. Uh, they asked me to do a presentation on Western media coverage about the Great March. And, you know, they they just asked, they said, you know, why don't we collaborate with Empire Files? It'd be really cool to, to document this and to do the story justice. And 
And so I directed the interviews and we got the footage back, of course, through the blockade. It was it was quite dire. Um, you know, they only have electricity for two to three hours a day. So I was getting these files uh, every couple of weeks, these huge files, whenever they can send them to me. And once I saw how incredibly brilliant and cinematic the footage was, I was just like, you guys, we need to make like a full documentary. Like this is not going to just be an Empire Files episode on YouTube. Like we need to make this into a movie because the videographers who risked their lives running towards the bullets at the Great March, Ozma, Tia Hamad, and Waz Maza, I mean, they are incredible incredibly talented, brave heroes. And in any just world, they would be receiving, you know, Oscar nominations for how incredible their cinematography was. And so I just wanted to do that justice as best I, to the best of my abilities. And just a really quick side note, it's really interesting, you know, a film like this, of course, will never be seen outside of just grassroots um, events like this, what Code Pink is doing. Um, but there, there are so many films about Palestine and Gaza being shown at, you know, these award ceremonies like the Oscars, for example, last year, there was a film called Gaza. Um, and of course, you wouldn't be included in these types of award ceremonies if you didn't have the right narrative, right? And so at the very beginning of the film, it's just quite funny because the very beginning, it just has a splash screen that's like Israel has had a blockade for the last 15 years. And that's literally the only time you hear Israel, the only time you hear about the blockade, why it's in place. There's no context whatsoever about why this area is besieged. And so it's just like, okay, just just filming Palestinians in Gaza and you know how, how lovely it is there. Um, but also like creating some empathy with, oh, no, they're human beings who are suffering, but there's no actual context of why. Who's the perpetrator? Who's doing this to them? Uh, so it's just a fascinating, fascinating thing. Um, there's so much out there about this subject, but so little that actually depicts the true story. So thank you so much, you guys. I encourage everyone to check out the film GazaFightsForFreedom.com. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for showing the clips. And thank you for everything that Code Pink does. It's incredibly inspiring. And I'm honored to be on the front lines of this fight with all of you. Well, thank you, Abby. It's our honor to have you, such an eloquent advocate. And we so appreciate your work, your film, and we'll get it out there uh, right now. And thank you, Ariel, as well. I'd like everybody to unmute, if you can, to thank our, our speakers, Abby Martin and Ariel Gold. <laughs>